Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the lecture for the chapter Cotton is King, the Antebellum South. Uh, we'll be covering period 1800 to 1860 again, continuing on with these chapters and these lectures that will bring us all the way up to just before the Civil War. It's kind of analyze many different um, reasons and aspects that bring us into war. And so we see that here uh, we're going to be looking at specifically the Antebellum South, the cotton, the economy, what's going on in the South. Last lecture was about the North, the industrialization, all the changes that were happening up there. So now we're going to take a look down South and see what's going on here. We're going to be looking at two things today. Um, that's cotton in the South and then African-Americans in the South. So these are our two kind of primary focuses for the lecture today. Starting off with cotton in the South, this is a map here of the four main um cash crops, so the crops that are uh, are grown specifically to make a profit off of, specifically to sell. Now, of course, there are way more crops that were grown in the South and way more cash crops that were grown in the South as well, especially in the Deep South, like Louisiana. We had a lot of um, indigo plantations in addition to sugar plantations, uh, sugar and rice plantations here. Um, but so this is an, an exhaustive list and you can see there are gaps throughout the south of um places you know that that aren't fit don't fit into these four but these are the four main the four biggest across the south um of the cash crops which is why they're picked out here um and you can see cotton here um is going to be really this middle part of the south um cotton needs really dry conditions and really good soil um which as you'll see as you get lower south um is not not the kind of, of soil that we have here so in terms of louisiana cotton's going to be mainly a northern to middle louisiana crop as you go further south we'll get rice sugar and indigo as our main crops down here but um this is a map from 1860 so where our chapter starts, but taking it back just a little bit, in 1787, so when we create the Constitution, when we are forming ourselves as a, uh, a country, we have almost no cotton being grown in the United States. But by 1815, there was a huge boom of it, and it becomes the primary crop of the South. You can see it's got the widest range of ability here. Um, cotton is kind of difficult to grow, and so that's why it wasn't really grown much prior to this boom in 1815. It wasn't as, people didn't make a, as much of a profit off of it as they did eventually. Um, so it was kind of ignored as a crop for a while. But because of that, um, and because of the the difficulty and, and the, the physical labor that's needed to grow crop, that's, I mean, to grow cotton, that is why it's so closely associated with slavery here because that's the plantations and those are the crops that really needed a huge amount of manual labor to tend to, um, especially on the scale that you needed to grow it to continue to make that profit. Um, and so of course there are slaves on, across the South and in the North um, doing a variety of different jobs, um, but because it's so prevalent in cotton plantations so see it says here um 1.8 million of the countries 3.2 million so about you know a little over a third um are involved in growing cotton so that's why it becomes so connected and so um you know people think slavery that's the first um image that really comes to their mind is a cotton plantation and you can see here we do have lots of pictures from the time of these plantations um and cotton Picking. So harvesting cotton occurred up to seven times a season, um, whereas with these other crops that you're growing, it's really going to be more traditional, more like once, maybe twice a season that you can harvest it. So cotton was like kind of always in um, in harvest. Um, and it a, has a very long season as well. It grows and produced through the fall and early winter. Um, and so, you know, depending on where you're at in the south, the fall can start anywhere from, you know, August to October, and then winter can go anywhere from January to, you know, April, May. So I'm sorry, April, March. <laughs> um, so it really depends on where in the South you are, how long of a season that you have. But in any case, no matter where you were, it was a very long season, especially compared to other uh, crops. So during the picking season, enslaved people are going to be working all day from sunrise to sunset, and they only have 10 minutes for lunch. Um, an enslaved person had to bring the cotton to the gin house to be waved. So 
these um, slaves are planting the cotton, they're tending the cotton, they are, um, you know, ensuring that it's growing and the way that it should be. They're picking the cotton, they're harvesting it. And then they have to bring it to the gin house. Um, this is not gin like the alcohol. Uh, this is a cotton gin the machine that you, is used to take out the very tiny little cotton seeds that are in the cotton um, to make it e usable. Um, and then after they did all of this from at least 12 hours a day, you know, if you say sunrise is at 6 a.m. and sunset 6 p.m., that's 12 hours a day, 10 minute break for lunch. After that, then they can care for their own animals and perform other chores um, and gardens and things like that. So just because the sun went down didn't mean the work stopped for these people. Um, the cotton gin is going to be able to remove seeds from 50 pounds of cotton a day. So it's this machine that you put the cotton into. And the textbook has um, diagrams of it that you can look at and it goes into a little bit more detail. Uh, but you put the cotton into it and then you crank it and it pulls the cotton through and then drops the seeds out. Um, and so that removes 50 seeds, I mean, sorry, 50 pounds of cotton a day compared to just one pound of cotton a day if done by hand. And so not all plantations had a cotton gin because they were new and they were expensive. So prior to the invention of the cotton gin, we're doing this by hand, right? The slaves are sitting there and after their work is done, going through all the cotton to get all the seeds out. Um, and then even when it's invented, if your plantation owner didn't want it or couldn't afford it, then you're still sitting there doing, you know, uh, seeding the cotton before you can even go on to anything else from your day. So after the seeds are removed, cotton is put into to bales that um, weigh four to 500 pounds, wrapped in burlap cloth and sent down the Mississippi River to New Orleans to be sold. They're gonna be transported on these steamships here. And the Mississippi River is gonna become the essential to moving goods and cargo in the United States. Remember we looked at that map when we did the Louisiana Purchase, um, that the Mississippi River is connected to every other river in the middle of the United States that trans you could go quite literally from almost the eastern seaboard almost all the way to the western um, and so it's a very important and a very navigable river right it becomes and an, um it becomes very important to the movement of goods cargo and people throughout the United States steamboats are going to become very crucial they're a big part of that transportation revolution that we talked about last week um because they can carry a lot of freight, a lot of cargo, um, they can you can build it really shallow, so you can still hold a lot of people and have a lot of movement without a whole lot of bottom ship. So when the Mississippi River and the other rivers get to their shallow parts, you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to transfer to a new boat. You can just keep on sailing. Um, and they can move really quick. They move a lot quicker than the other boats uh, prior to them. They're also symbolic of this class and social distinction that happens in antelope society. Um, oops. The people who are using these for pleasure are gonna be um, upper class white people. Um, and there's really gonna be no other type of person on that ship unless they're working for the ship. So unless they're a slave or unless they're a lower class a white person who's like the captain or the deckhand or things like that. The only other thing that'll be transported onto this ship uh, is goods, so cargo, your cotton, things like that. But it's only gonna be transported on this ship if your plantation owner is wealthy enough to afford the transportation cost to put it on this ship. So this is really gonna be very emblematic of the rising upper wealthy white class of the Southern society in any way that you kind of look at it. Um, and so this will not be the only means of getting things on or around the Mississippi River. We will still have little paddle boats, little rafts. We will still have um, ships that are not as big as the steamboats, but bigger than a little rowboat that you still have to, you know, use oars to move. Um, so there'll be lots of different boats on the river, but the steamship is going to be the one that really signals the future and really becomes the new norm, the new site on the river. Now, I forgot to put this picture in here too, but this is what I was just saying before about the Louisiana Purchase. This here, um, we're going to follow it with this red cursor. This is the Mississippi River, okay? So this one river here that I'm following is the Mississippi River from start to finish. But you can see this one river 
branches off and connects to almost the entire country based off of this just one river, right? You can see it goes all the way up to the north or to the uh, Montana, these western states, um, almost until you hit the desert, they hit the mountains here. Um, that's where it kind of cuts off. And then same thing here, you hit the Appalachians over here. Um, but in general, your entirety of, of, of the country is connected and you can take something from say Baton Rouge here, right? And you could get it to New York pretty easily. You just follow these rivers and then you go as far as you can go, right? Or New York actually would be more up here. <laughs> you get as far as you can go and then that's where you have to stop. And then you only have to transport it over land from here to your final destination. So even if you still have to get something to transport on land, it cuts down the cost and it cuts down the time. So it makes it much more appealing for someone to use it as um, an option to transport compared to just doing it completely the whole way over land, which also means that it opens up our um, places that we can sell these things at. Now, this um, New Orleans is going to become pretty big and important and rise in prominence in the early 19th century because of this cotton boom, um, because you saw the Mississippi River empties at New Orleans. So to get things out of the country, New Orleans is going to be a very huge port city for that. It'll be very uh, metropolitan, um, very uh, cosmopolitan as well. And so from New Orleans, a large majority of American cotton is going to go to England which is going to create lucrative international trade um, for the plantation owners and, and the people in England, but also specifically for New Orleans, because New Orleans gets to control that river traffic and that trade. It all has to come through the port of New Orleans. Um, and by 1840, New Orleans is going to have 12% of the nation's banking capital in New Orleans. So headquarters of major banks being in New Orleans. Um, and it also this is going to increase, greatly increase the cultural diversity of the city, which is why New Orleans is, um, you know, of course, everybody thinks their own city is different compared to other cities, right? Or their own state is different than other states. But this is a main reason why New Orleans truly is so different than any other city in America, and even any other city in the state of Louisiana. Um, it has a very unique, specific history that is the reason it is the way that it is and the reason that it is today the way it is um and part of this gets kicked off here because of this cotton boom um in 1835 joseph holt ingram um he's a, a writer journalist he's gonna write truly does new orleans represent every other city and nation upon earth i know of none where is congregated so great a variety of the human species that everyone is welcome here everyone has a place here you know, there are still social divisions um, at this time um, as far as what privileges and rights are given to different people based on the color of their skin. But there is a great more great, a higher degree of integration here at this time than there is anywhere else. New Orleans has the highest concentration of uh, free people of color at this time as well. And so free people of color up until when the Civil War happens are encoded as a specific class of people in the city that have certain rights that are different from the rights of slaves. Um, and so we're, it sounds really exaggerated and really hyperbolic when we say, oh, New Orleans is different, New Orleans is better, New Orleans is different. Um, but in some ways it is true, right? It is a different reality here that exists prior to the Civil War than does anywhere else in America. And it's because of that, that integration of people. Um, slave labor, cotton, and the steamship are going to cause New Orleans to become a bustling metropolis that rivaled New York City at this time. Um, obviously, we don't really rival it anymore, um, but at this time, it did. It was the second um, busiest, second, second most metropolitan city after New York City. All right, switching gears to get African Americans in the South. So we have a couple of different types of African Americans in the South that we can look at to get a better understanding of what the landscape looked like prior to the Civil War. The first one, of course, is enslaved people. Um, slaveholders are going to rely on this idea of paternalism, that they are doing what's best for this enslaved people, and that enslaved people are lesser because they just simply cannot. They do not have the capacity to do better or think for themselves. 
So that's the mentality that a lot of these slave holders are going to bring. Uh, but they're going to be using it as a me method of control and coercion. Um, and some enslaved people are going to use this idea of, of paternalism to their advantage, right? They're going to pick, you're going to pick up, you know, you know, when somebody's being condescending to you. So they pick up on that and they use it to their advantage. Um, they can hide their intelligence and pretend to be ignorant and then disrupt the workday and break equipment through accidents, right? And then the white man thinks, oh, well, you're an idiot. So of course it was an accident. You wouldn't even know how to break this if you, if you could, right? Uh, and the whole time, uh, that is what's happening, right? We're using this to our advantage to kind of find even a little bit of, of, um, of help in our current situation. Um, this resistance is also going to be used to hide their ability to read and write, um, which will allow the slaves to organize in secret and communicate between plantations. Um, teaching slaves to read and write English is something that will happen at the very beginning when we first start bringing slaves over, um, but it is quickly done away with because it's seen as the reason that these slave revolts happen, which is part of it. Um, but Louisiana will be one of the first, or I'm sorry, one of the last ones to get rid of that. It is encoded into our um, laws for a very long time that if you own slaves, you do have to teach them to read and write, at least at a basic level. Um, and so that will eventually go away. But that is another kind of thing that that sets out and sets us up for a different kind of culture here than in the rest of the country. Um, of course, physical punishments and death. They're going to be used, but they are the most extreme threats against the enslaved people. They're not used. Um, they're not used as a first offense kind of thing. They're really a last resort kind of extreme um, punishment. Um, and though slave marriage is not legal and not recorded in slave ledgers, the practice did occur. And depending on your plantation owner is if that was respected or not. And every way that you can imagine, I'm using the word respect for marriage. Um, another class of citizen is a free people of color, and more free people of color lived in the South than in the North, uh, and more most of them lived in New Orleans. There's a higher concentration there. About 261,000 free people of color lived in, in slave states, and only 226,000 lived in free states. Part of the reason for this is because free people will stay in the areas that they're freed from um, or close to the livelihood that they had before. So if you're a slave who gets freed by your master, you're not gonna have enough money to move or leave the state. Um, you're also maybe not gonna know or want to learn new skills. So you're gonna end up staying where you're at, where you're freed. Um, so that's one reason for the higher concentration in the South. Um, the other higher concentration, the other reason, especially for Louisiana, um, is that they resided here prior to the Louisiana Purchase. Um, France had a huge um, idea and conceptualization of free people of color. Um, they were in, like members of society, um, and they weren't all necessarily freed slaves. They were just people who were never enslaved. Um, and so they lived here in New Orleans uh, and then the French territories prior to the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and so, of course, just continued to stay on here. Um, additionally, there's free people of color from Cuba and Haiti, uh, both with Spanish and French he uh, heritage that will migrate to Louisiana. Um, again, Spain, much like France, had this also this idea of this free person of color um, being in their society. And most free people of color are going to reside in cities. Um, and where the products of or engaged in interracial relationships. This is another big way that um, the, the, the uh, higher concentration comes out, that there are interracial relationships, not necessarily marriages, um, but and not necessarily like hidden relationships, but um, that they're either engaged in them, so they are the person dating or married or whatever word you want to use um, to an interracial person uh, or interracial, interracial relationship, or they're giving birth to mixed children. And so, of course, because the parent is not a slave, that child is also not a slave. And so we get this higher population of free people of color here. 
Now, a big thing that happens throughout history, but especially picks up prior to the Civil War, is these slave revolts. And there's going to be two major ones in the antebellum South, one in 1811 in Louisiana. So Louisiana slave revolt. There are many others, but this is like the one that we talk about. Um, and then one in 1831 in Virginia, which is Nat Turner's Rebellion. Um, in 1811, the one in Louisiana is going to be people in uh, Louisiana who have ties to Haiti are going to get start hearing reports about a successful sl slave revolt there that overthrows the white planter class. Um, and so the slaves here in Louisiana will be inspired by that and want to, excuse me, will try to make it happen here. Ultimately, they're not going to, um, they're not going to be successful, uh, but as many as 500 enslaved people will join that rebellion. It'll be led by Charles Deslandes, a mixed race slave driver on a, a sugar plantation owned by Manuel Andre. Oops. And the revolt's going to begin on that plantation with an attack on the household where they killed um, Andrew's son. And then they'll begin traveling towards New Orleans, uh, armed with weapons that they got from the plantation that they're picking up along the way. We will dispatch militias to stop the rebellion, but not before Deslandes and the other enslaved people will um, set fire to three other plantations and then kill numerous white people on their march. Um, a small force led by Andre, that original plantation owner, will capture Deslandes. Um, he they will mutilate his body and burn him following his execution. And then other rebels will be beheaded um, and their heads placed on spikes along the Mississippi River. Um, there, I'm not sure if it's a yearly thing, but about a few years ago, um, there was a reenactment of this mar or not a reenactment that's not the best word a um, memorial of this march um where a group of people marched uh, along the river um i forgot where they started but they marched up to new orleans up to the site where um everything's happened and then had a memorial uh service there um so it's important to keep these things alive and in our memories so that we know we're we're recognizing where we've come from um but also we're keeping these people um, their their ideas, their memories alive as well. The other uh, slave revolt that we'll look at is in 1831 in Virginia. Um, Nat Turner, um, he will um, be put into enslavement and he will have his wife sold away from him. Um, and he's a radical Christian. And he becomes convinced that he is like Christ and that he should lay down his life to end slavery. And so he will gather a big force of people um, and he will kill a whole bunch of white people in the country um, where his plantation was. Um, but we're going to have a big return, a big white mobilization there. And then uh, two days later, 48 hours, the rebellion's over. Um, and then in response to that Turner's rebellion, Virginia state legislature is going to consider ending slavery. They're going to say this is too much, like this is you know, too much of a, um, of a threat of a problem, but, uh, in instead, they ultimately will decide that slavery is going to remain, uh, but that they will put more restrictions on what slaves can and cannot do. Uh, and their state will continue to play a key role in the domestic slave trade because they get a lot of their money from actually importing and selling slaves here. And that'll bring us to the end of this lecture about African-Americans in the antebellum South. You can see there's lots of different things going on for African-Americans here, whether they're enslaved, whether they're free people of color. And there's also uh, this weird tie for the Southern economy to cotton and thereby to slaves, to slavery. Um, and all of this will really push us more and more towards war. Um, we'll see it in the next few weeks as we try to make compromises, but we just don't stick to them or we don't really try them. And eventually we'll get closer and closer and then ultimately we'll go to war with each other. Um, but that'll be it for this lecture. Definitely read a little bit, or uh, read the whole textbook. It goes a little bit more into information about um, everything I talked about, but especially about Nat Turner's Rebellion. It gives you a little bit more context there. talks about that a little bit more. So make sure that you read that, uh, read up on that. Um, other than that, that'll be the end of this lecture, and I'll see you back here next time.